That's right. Okay. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll look at this ninth chapter of Judges. Lord, thank you for this time. We always thank you when we can gather in your name. It's always a privilege for us to do so. We should never take it lightly. Certainly many people, Christians in the world, put themselves at great risk to meet together. And uh, uh, we don't know how that may go in our country eventually. So we thank you. We pray for your presence. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. We pray also that these truths that are built into your word, that they apply to our hearts, to our minds, to our lives, and that we see these patterns and we begin to think day to day how we should act. So give us this mindset. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's read the first six verses of chapter 9. There's a couple titles that I thought about when I did this. One of them that I kind of came up with based on what goes on in this first part of this chapter I wrote down, it could be called the ambition that leads to ruin. That's one way to put it, to try to characterize it. Another one that came to my mind is uh, the the agenda of how to create a coup, because that's also what really is going on here. I wanted to turn to the book of Habakkuk, because there's a verse that I think that is has a lot to do in in the, it's the spirit of this teaching tonight um, and it's Habakkuk chapter two you don't have to turn there you can whatever uh, and it's um, two ver and it's chapter two verse twelve it says woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and who founds a town with violence. That's a good theme for what we're going to see tonight here in Judges 9. So let's uh, go there and let me read the first six verses of Judges 9, and then we will try to understand what is being said. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and spoke to them and the whole clan of the household of his mother's father, saying, Speak now in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that seventy men, all the sons of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, remember, that's his nickname is Jerubbabel, against Baal. Okay? Now, think about, as we go on this chapter, why he keeps using his that term for Gideon. Remember, he's a son of Gideon also, through a concubine. And I want you to keep in mind, there's a, there's a very intricate strategy going on in what Abelech is doing. So why does he keep using, you know, Jerubbabel against Baal, all right? And you've got to think about this town that he's in. We'll talk about it. It says... Uh, speak now in the hearing of all the elders of Shechem, which is better for you that 70 men, all the sons of Jerubbabel, uh, rule over you, or that one man rules over you. Also remember that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf. Think about that, okay? Uh, in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem, and they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, well, he's our relative. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver from the house of baal Bareth, which is right there in Shechem, what they worship. That was the Baal, the Baal center, Baal worship center in Shechem at that point. With which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows. We'll talk about what that means, okay? And they followed him. Then they went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jerubbabel, 
70 men, one, uh, and, and, and they did so on a stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabal, was left, for he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem and all the men of Beth Milo assembled together, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar, which is there in Shechem. All right? So let me talk a little bit about what this means and try to kind of tear this apart a little bit. Shechem is about 30 miles from Ophrah. Okay? Of course, Ophrah was Gideon's hometown. This is where, in the area, his 70 sons lived, or his, maybe you could say his 69 sons, okay? Uh, the 70th presumably being Abimelech here. Now, he was, Abimelech was conceived by a concubine who lived in Shechem. Now, the concubine lived with her family. Therefore, Abimelech lived with her and her family in Shechem. Okay? You follow so far? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, concubines had little legal status or little legal claim uh, in Judaism especially, and even in non-Jewish cultures. Therefore, she was a convenient but cast-off individual, and therefore, presumably, had very little contact with Gideon at all. We can't know for sure, and I'm going to speculate on some of the motivations, but the reason I'm going to speculate, and you decide if it's worthwhile speculation, is because of his behaviors. I think his behaviors tell us things about his attitude. And you you decide if you think that's true as we go on. So we don't know how much or how or ever if Gideon visited this boy. We don't know if they had a real relationship with each other or whether there was any real relationship between Abimelech and the 69 other sons of, of Gideon. Now, but it's, it's extremely likely, as I'm going to show you by his behavior, that the boy felt that he was, quote, the forgotten son, okay? That, uh, and that because of that, uh, he lacked certainly, as a result of it, very little parental influence, and certainly it was likely that he was angry about the fact that he didn't have this kind of involvement. He had a famous father, famous father, and he was, you know, even though he was one of the sons of his father, he obviously was not in any way in the limelight like the other 69 were that lived in Ophrah. So far, does that make sense? It's, it's, maybe you could say it's somewhat speculative, but I think as we add these behaviors we're going to see in them together, I think it makes sense at least. I think it's very possible that he was, quote, the little man, the forgotten son, and that he had a great need, therefore, to become important. All right? Now, I want to make this point, and then I'm going to show you something. As we go through tonight, if you think about it, you may see in these patterns events which seem to be reflected in our present culture at this time. You decide, but I I think you're going to find if you start to think about it, there's a lot of patterns that somehow are very eerily similar. I'm not saying that this section is specifically prophetic about, for instance, this country. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that because of human behavior and because of the tendencies of human behavior, we tend to find these patterns leading to certain cultural patterns. And, and I think because of that, we, they appear, it appears like that history seems to repeat itself. But it's really because of the way people act in a culture and the movements that they have in that culture that history seems to repeat itself in this way. What we see, of course, in history overwhelmingly is the, re, is the pattern of recurrent tragedy in culture after culture after culture. And if you study history, 
you look more and see these patterns of recurrent tragedies over and over again. Now, Shechem was a place of a very mixed heritage. Okay? From the Jewish standpoint, it, of course, was a place associated with Jacob's well. All right? It also was a place where Joseph's bones were buried there in Shechem when they brought his bones back from Egypt. Okay? Also, we know that it was close to the bases. It's almost in between, literally. The bases of these two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, which we certainly, when we studied the conquest in Joshua, we talked, there was a whole chapter on Gerizim and Ebal. And if you'll remember, those are the places where Joshua took the people and he put half of them on out Mount Gerizim and he taught put half of them on Mount Ebal, all right? And he stood there on this platform that literally still seems to exist there on Mount Gerizim, and he declared the cursings and the blessings to the people, and they had to hear the whole law there, okay? So it was a monumental national moment for them that they're introduced again to remind them of the whole law, and they're specifically told what's going to happen to them if they disobey the Lord and the blessings they'll receive if they obey the Lord, okay? So that was another uh, event which occurred in this area. But, of course, because Israel did not remove the Canaanites from the land that they were told to do, repeatedly warned by Joshua, at the end of, of the time of the conquest, when it was time to separate the tribes out, and by lot they were given their special areas, each and every time, what did he tell them? As you go to your area, make certain that you get rid of, them, you get rid of them all because there'll be a, a thorn to your side, there'll be briars in your eyes, and yada, yada. Now, he made it very abundantly clear, but they didn't do it. So what happened is that especially, not only, but especially this area, became an, a center for Baal worship. They had a great altar to Baal in Shechem. Now we see here that Abimelech shrewdly appeals to his, mother, his mother's relatives and also to the leaders and the people of Shechem. Okay? He's trying to build support for a movement for himself. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to develop a power base for this movement. What he wants clearly to do is to become the king and have a dynasty. That's clearly what he's all about. Now, he asked the leaders, do you really want to be ruled by the sons of Gideon? Now, part of the reason why he does that, and this is why he uses his name Jer Jerubbabel and not Gideon, is because what did Gideon do at the beginning of his ministry? The altar to Baal and Ophrah. So he's clearly in opposition to Baal. He, he took the position, clear opposition to Baal worship, and these people are ad, adamant Baal worshipers. So he's saying, do you want those people to rule over you? Literally, he's saying, do you want your lifestyle and your choice about these things stopped by their, their dictates or their lifestyle? Don't you have a right to live life the way you want to do it and be religious the way you want to do it? Isn't this what you really want? Does this sound familiar to you at all? Okay. Why is it in this country that the left at this point in our country seems to absolutely hate the right? Hate them. Have, they won't discuss things. There's no meeting of minds. There's no calm, you know, nothing. There's no political discussions. There's just agendas and power moves. <clears throat> the bottom line to me about why they hate the movement of the right is because they see the movement of the right as threatening the things that they're trying to do to change the culture to the left. Mm -hmm. sure. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why they hate anyone that advocates anything that's, that's of the right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, the same thing I think was going on here. All right. These, you know, remember what Baal worship is. 
It's prostitution. It's idol worship. It's uh, it's uh, uh, sexual acts in the in the in the midst of supposedly worshiping this fertility cult. It involves the worst imaginable things. It, it involves human sacrifice also. I mean, it was horrid. And yet these people were adamant that this was what they wanted to do. So this is why I think he, he shrewdly makes this point to them. All right? Now, also, he makes a second argument. He says, you knew me. I grew up here. All right? In other words, here's the argument of the classic politician. I'm the hometown boy. You know? I grew up here, y'all. You know? You know my family. You know my cousins. You know, I'm of you. This is the argument. It's been used for politicians for uh, however long we've had politicians, probably. Now, like I said, uh, he's trying to stir up a political base and, a, and to motivate his movement. And part of the way he's doing this is he's pitting people against people, right? He's pointing out those people, those 70 sons up there in Oprah, do you want them to ruin your choices and your lifestyle and your religious worship? You know, they're the people, their father tore down an altar to Baal and offended your God. So he starts setting up this division. He starts to stir up animosity towards the sons of Gideon, the 70 sons, or 69 probably, up there. You follow it? Mm -hmm. People are typical. It's all responsive to any kind of Oh, yes. Stuff. Okay. Like that. Now, if you've ever studied any of the writings of Lenin, Lenin was an absolute master of this. Mm -hmm. Lenin sat outside of Russia in various countries and wrote all kinds of literature in papers, in documents, even in handbills that were, were got sent, smuggled into Russia, circulated around. And what was his, ultimately his point? Look at how the upper class is, is taking advantage of you. Look at, how, look at how they live and look at how you live. You have to struggle to get by. Look at the czarist family. Look at the, the places that they live. Look at the palaces they live in. You know, I think it's very ironic, and you may not know this, about Russian history, but I'll tell you that Nicholas II, who lived around the same time as Abraham Lincoln, was a land reformer in Russia. He was the one that ended the medieval practice of serfdom in Russia. He gave people the right to buy land, okay? So here comes Lenin. He tries to stir up in every way he can this, this hatred between the worker and the upper class, they're using you. You know, they're making all this money. It's the capitalist system. Look what it's doing to you. That's exactly what he argued, okay? They have everything you have nothing. Exactly. You know, absolutely. <laughs> it's the same game plan. Well, yes, it is. It's the same game, and it's always been the same game plan. You know, I'm just showing you, it's the game plan here, too. It's an age-old game plan. You know, here's the irony. Lenin stirs up the masses. What does Lenin call them to his confidants? He called the masses the useful idiots. That's what he called them. Okay? And what's but, the difference between Soros and what he's doing? Exactly. It's exactly, it's exactly the same, same thing. thing. You pay, you fund, you stir up the useful idiots. Okay? You get agitators. We'll talk about that in a minute because he had his group of agitators. We'll go into that. Okay? Now, here's the irony, and it's the irony of these lies. Nicholas II made land reform so that people could buy their own land in Russia. At the, at the, at the 1917 October Revolution, when the communists go, came, came in to power, all land ownership went back to state. the state. He took away the very thing that the czars tried to give the people. Okay? Isn't it? And these lies are unbelievable. And yet these people are, are orators, they're writers, you know, they come up with these strategies. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. So, <clears throat> now, 
also, of course, we see that, that he is using what I'll call the family card. That is, he's our brother, he's our son, he's our cousin, he's our nephew. And, of course, all of these things that he started tried to stir up, uh, if, you'll note, if you'll note them, that they have nothing to do with any real reason or any critical thinking whatsoever. Okay? He's creating anger to motivate a movement for him. That's what he's doing. Okay? It's all about the self. It's not about the welfare of other people genuinely. None of these movements like this have ever been about the real good of people. They're about the power brokers that want to get power. And as soon as they do, they become the elitist themselves over the people. The very thing they argued that was terrible, they do it themselves because that's human nature. And the people don't see it. And the people don't see it coming. William Penn, who, of course, we have the name for that state next door, Pennsylvania, made this statement. He says, if you're not willing to be governed by God, then you shall be, you shall be ruled by tyrants. Mm -hmm. Very true statement, isn't it? Okay. Oh, that would have been, you know, 17, I don't have the exact date, 1760s, 1750s. I don't know exactly, but somewhere there, prior to, prior to the revolution. So could he see forward? He absolutely could see forward. It's amazing. Some people have profound insight uh, in these things. Our founders had profound insight. Tragically, we don't listen to them. Do you think they had the similar tendencies back then? I think they had identical tendencies. That's why you said that. Yeah, absolutely. It's human nature that gets involved in a movement and creates a, a result. That's what he's saying. So, these officials of the altar of Baal release money. Notice 70 pieces of silver. I don't think 70 is an arbitrary number here. I think you're going to see why. Now he has financial backing to pursue his movement. Right? Does that seem familiar? Do we see financial backing being done to create a movement, okay? George Soros and all kinds, the Bill Gates Foundations, the, 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 uh, the uh, I mean, there, there's just innumerable uh, organizations that have money fun funneled into them for globalism, for climate change, for all these purposes. They get this funding to promote a movement. He found his funding through the, the altar there, the temple at Baal, to, get, to, to fund his movement. Now, note, note what, what is interesting about this. How does this money come about from the, from the altar of Baal? Well, it comes from the revenue from prostitution. It comes from taxes on Baal worshipers. It come from, comes from mandatory offerings to Baal. It comes from the sale of different kinds of icons, trinkets, all kinds of images we see. We have certainly archaeologically all those images that are made, they're virtually pornographic, sale of these things to put in your private home, the idols. This is where this money is, okay? They generate this money. Now, how do we see generation of money in a political uprising? Well, usually it's funded by investors. It's funded by drug sales, illegal drug sales. It's funded by illegal arms and munition sales and funding. You know, it's, it, it, it usually results from corrupt activity. If you go back to it, you see all kinds of corrupt activity. Do you know where George Soros got his start in life? Mm -hmm. His political start? Tell him. Well, the big thing that came about was over in Europe. And what, and what was he a part of? What state, what country was, that, was it? All he was in Hungary. Hungary. Do you know what he was part of in Hungary? Confiscation of artwork. But, exactly. But what, what movement was he part of? He, no, Nazis. He was a young man that did did book work for the Hungarian Nazi Party, as, as I remember. He had to get to see that. And that point at that time was a matter of feeding his self and family members. And he was in awe of a man named Adolf. Of course. And they had 
similarities because Adolf was a person that wanted to be an artist. Very good. No, don't go too far because we're going to talk about Adolf tonight. <laughs> you're you're on my you're on my line there. You okay? okay? All right. Now say that again, Suzanne. Uh, confiscation. Yes. Yeah, confiscation of artwork. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who confiscated artwork? The Nazis did. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. do you know, do you know why? No. Was well, to be part of the Third Reich and the. Mm -hmm. the why did he take it? Hitler, when in his youth. You're right. That's a good point. To be an artist. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. And he went to when he got to be 16, 17 years of age, and his dad had died, and his mother. I want you to listen to this statement. His mother had, with the, the loss of the father. The mother, he had a massive foreign area at a fairly young age, about 50, 55. Hitler was 14 when his father died. Here we go. Okay. And so at that point in time, his mother had to clean houses and all types of means of the worst, of the worst, like nurses and bedpans. I mean, it doesn't get any worse a lot of times than that, but uh, she had to do that. Uh, I want you to think about where he went in life, okay? And when he went to uh, Austria to become at university an artist, they rejected him totally. Mm -hmm. And he had numerous phenomenal drawings. And what Watercolors on postcards were the things he specialized in. Well, but in, in his, what, what you would call today, I think, am I right, Kathy? Portfolio, is that right? Portfolio. Yeah. Portfolio, the artist would know over here. And so he was told to move over to become an architect. And who was the closest person in the Third Reich next to Adolf? One of the generals. Was it Himmler? Himmler. No. Goebbels? Goebbels? No. Himmler? No. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very good point. I'll leave it at this, okay? He was the architect for Hitler to design every building <laughs> and when they had the Nuremberg trials, he got off. And he was the second highest Nazi in the organization. Last name. Mm -hmm. Borman. Mm -hmm. Borman? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, okay. He, he was the head of the Air Force. Okay. I'll leave that be and let All you right. guys research it till right. next week, yeah. but it's an easy name to come up and find. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just Google that. Who was the who was the architect for the Third Reich? Okay. No, All right. Um, let's go on here. Now, notice what notice what it is that Gideon the, the Gideon that Abimelech does next. It says that he hires quote reckless fellows. What does your translation say? Reckless. Okay, uh, that's okay. That's actually pretty good. That's worthless and reckless. Okay. So the word in Hebrew is is the word interestingly rak r e k r e q. And it means empty, vain, or foolish. As a matter of fact, I want to show you, I'll read to you real quickly, I think a, a proverb that's particularly relevant here. You can turn or not turn, doesn't matter. I'm going to go to the 12th chapter of Proverbs, and I'm going to read verses uh, 11, 11 and 12. You want us to go with you? He says... What name did you get? Very good. Okay. All right. Focus, children. Okay. Okay. It says, Proverbs 12, 11, 11 and 12. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues vain things lacks sense. Same word there in Hebrew. Okay. Notice verse 12. The wicked desires the booty of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. Make sense? Mm -hmm. the, the principle of, you know, 
obviously Solomon well understood the principles of human tendencies and warns us about these things. Now, in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the Greek, the, the Greek version and the Septuagint, the word is translated kenos. That's the Greek version. It means unsuccessful, unaccomplished, and implies the idea of Losers. losers. That's the implication in the Greek. So he stirs up and hires these losers. Okay? And of course, men who would do anything for enough money. These are the movement agitators. Okay? Now think about movement agitators. They're funded by a certain amount of money. They're paid a certain amount. They go out and they protest. They stir up a situation. They try to get a crowd. They try to create a riot. They try to get uh, a focus. If it's media, they try to get the media focus, et cetera, et cetera. But this is exactly the kind of people that he hired. Or have testimonies that might not be true. Yes, or have testimonies that may not be true, or testimonies that might be made up. Now, now, now it's interesting that this is exactly the game plan of so many movements. Lenin, as I said, did this with the people, the common people that he got as agitators. He called them useful idiots, okay? All right. We find that Hitler did this by the brown shirt movement. He would get all these young people in the brown shirt movement, stir them all up with his rhetoric, and they'd go around and, and yeah, they'd, they'd break, break into Jewish businesses, they'd break stuff, they'd riot, they'd do all this stuff. And of course, he was absolutely motivating all this and funding it, causing it. Mao did the same thing with the Cultural Revolution in China. He'd stir up all the young students, say that the, that the, that the people around weren't good enough communists, good enough Chinese, and what would, the, what would they do to them? Bring, uh, bring, and they'd bring them to justice, yeah. justice of the state. Okay, quote unquote. Both Hitler and Stalin and Lenin all had one philosophy. Once in power, stay in power yeah. by controlling everyone, yeah. which yeah. is what you're teaching. Exactly. Now, I've got a great quote about that. Norman's reading my mind tonight about this, okay? <laughs> but it, it's exactly what they did. It's precisely what they did. Here's an interesting quote. Most of the troubles in the world are caused by people who want to be important. Isn't that true? Yeah. That's very true. Now, he hires with these 70 pieces of silver either, and it's hard, it's hard to know exactly which one, either bounty hunters or assassins. I'm thinking more bounty hunters because they obviously captured 69 other sons and brought them to Shechem because they publicly executed them, clearly, Okay. What they did, of course, is they killed them on a rock. They made a spectacle of killing these 69 sons of Gideon. All right? Absolutely. These were the people who the revolution hated. These were the people that were a threat to the revolution, the movement of uh, Abimelech, right? Same game plan with Hitler, with Mao. We see it more recently. Okay. All these things. It's the same principle. So they, they executed them. It's hard to know exactly whether it was a ritual sacrifice execution on the altar of Baal. It's possible, but we're not really told what that stone was. But one thing is clear. It shows you the principle that when you have a movement going, it ultimately leads to genocide without fail. Always leads to genocide. Because you turn on your political opponents see them as threats, you must get rid of them, and then even they go further, and we'll see that in a moment with, with some quotes I want to read to you, then they go and they start to call through their own people, getting rid of the most educated and those that they consider to be potential threats, even in their own country and their own people, and they get rid of them too. They want the dumbest of the dumb left, the least educated of all, the ones that are the simplest workers, that's who they want left. We call them gray mass. Gray mass? Gray, gray crowd. Gray crowd. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's, so that's the term you have in Russia for that, the people in that movement. All right. 
Now, directors up fast. As a crowd, right. Now we see here that only one person survived this this mm -hmm. political assassination, okay? And his name was Jotham. He was the youngest son of Gideon. So he survived this purge. The men of Shechem then, after this, turn to Abimelech and make him king. And ironically, this they they do this at, a, at the oak there, which is the very place where Joshua, in Joshua 24, at the end of his life, verse 26, placed the book of the law. <laughs> Isn't that ironic and tragic? It's really very tragic. Now, let's go back to chapter 9 and read verses 7 through 15. You're going to see that, that Jotham had a very interesting reaction to all of this. I think it's a very interesting reaction. His reaction is that he apparently writes and publicly gives a parable about all this. Here's the parable. Let's read it. It says, Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on the, ta on the top of Mount Gerizim. That's where this platform, rock platform is, in this natural amphitheater. It's between these two hills. I mean, it, Joshua used it. All kinds of people used this natural amphitheater. You, one person could speak, and they could, uh, people on the other side of the mountain could hear it because of the contours of the, of the mountain. So he stood on, the mount, on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and called out and says, Thus he said to them, the people there in Shechem, Okay, did this. He said, listen to me, O men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Once the trees went forth to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my fatness with which God and men are honored and go and wave over or be over the trees, the trees representing the people of Shechem in the movement, okay? And he says, when the, uh, And the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go and wave or rule over those other trees? Then the tree said to the vine, the grapevine, You come and reign over us. Then the vine said to them, Shall I leave my new wine which cheers men and God and men, and go and wave over those trees. Finally, all the trees said to the bramble, you know what a bramble is, yeah. a thorn bush. Yeah. I'll talk about it in a minute. All the trees said to the bramble, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you are anointing me as king over you, come and take refuge in my shade, which is a great irony because there's no way that a bramble gives any shade whatsoever, okay, at all, okay? And he says, come and take refuge in my shade, but if not, may fire come out of from the bramble, and we'll discuss what that means, and consume the cedars of Lebanon, which is an incredibly arrogant statement, that the fire out of a bramble, a little thorn bush, is going to somehow threaten the cedars of Lebanon, okay? But that's what is said here. So let's go through this. So despite the risk to his life, he wasn't willing to simply silently run off. He had to make a statement. He had and 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 he had to address this issue of what happened. So he ends up climbing Mount Gerizim, which is an 800 foot climb from the valley where you can get to it, to the top where this kind of older pulp rock pulpit, if you want to call it is, and, uh, and from this known area, this kind of pulpit that juts out, he cites this parable into this natural amphitheater. Interestingly, he stands on, quote, the Mount of Blessing, Gerizim, and issues a curse. Ebal is the Mount of Cursing, Gerizim is the Mount of Blessing, Okay. He doesn't raise a small army. He doesn't start a counter-movement. 
He doesn't start trying to collect people to himself to correct this terrible wrong of all of killing of all of his brothers. All right? That's not what he does. He does really a very interesting thing. He simply gives this rather prophetic parable. It's almost like he's giving in the spirit of vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. He doesn't take action himself. I think he's inspired personally by the Lord. He doesn't say it exactly, but if you see it, I think you'll see it's the spirit of God in the in this, yeah. of this truth that's going to come through, and it's very prophetic. And you'll see how prophetic it is as we go through the next part of chapter 9. So, the trees in this parable are the men of the city, his family members, and those individuals that are in his movement. Okay? They decide first to make an invitation to the olive tree to become king. The olive tree, of course, is one of the most beautiful, large, and important trees in Palestine, in the whole area of Israel. From it, one uh, gets, it produces olive oil, which is used for fuel, for lamps. It produces food and olives. It, it's a source of many medicines that were made in the, in the oil base. It was used as a lubricant. It was used as a leather softener. It could be carved. It could be turned into beautiful things. Where is our, we don't have olive wood up there right now, do we, honey? We don't have any olive wood up there right now, do we? Okay. Uh, you'll see in a few weeks, we'll, we'll bring our nativity out. And it's carved out of olive wood from Israel. It's absolutely beautiful wood. So they approach this olive tree, and they say, why don't you be the king? But the olive tree has a very interesting response. Why should I leave my position that God gave me and do that? It's almost an implication as he goes through each one of these trees. Why would I want to be king over you? <laughs> That's really what he's more or less saying in these, okay? Now, also, I have to note something because I'm a nerd and I have to note these things, okay? This is another principle of the law first mentioned. This is the first parable in the Bible, right here, by Jotham. We have other parables that occur in the Old Testament, and then, of course, all of Jesus' parables, but this is the very first one, so it has a very interesting position in the Bible because of it. So, is this like the very, very, first very first one, first parable in the whole, in the whole Bible. So, Rhetorically, the tree asks, should I leave all this goodness and rule over you people? And, of course, the answer is no. Now, they then next turn to the fig tree. Of course, the fig tree rhetorically says, should I give up my appointed role as pro for producing food, figs, and all the sweetness that they bring to the people that eat them? There are a few fruits in, in, Pal in the area of Israel that are as tasty as figs, okay? They're, they're, they're a source of tremendous natural sweetness. And he says, should I give up my role in producing these good things for people and become you, your king? And of course, the answer really is no. Then, of course, they go to the grapevine. And they say, and the, the grapevine says, should I give up my intended role to produce wine, grapes for food, okay, that makes people happy, okay, and satisfies them, should I give that up for you people? So it also declines. Now, of course, now they turn to the fourth, the briar bush, or a bramble. Now, here's the things that are interesting about the briar. It's not good for wood. You can't do a single thing with it, okay? It's not big enough or stable enough. You can't carve it. You can't use it for much of anything whatsoever. It's an absolute nuisance bush. I mean, people make great efforts in, in the Middle East to get rid of briar, okay? It's thorny. It's horrible to handle. You get cut on it. There's just not a good thing about the bramble that you can think of. It's full of thorns, as I said. It has no fruit. There's no fruit from a bramble. You can't, ironically, when he says, come under my shade, good luck for a bramble to find shade under it. 
Okay, it's low to the ground. It doesn't produce any shade. And if you get close enough to it, you get caught in the thorns. So it's absolutely useless. But, of course, this useless bush, okay, says, I accept. I'll be your king. And, of course, this is Abimelech. Now, notice there's a reference here to my fire. It's interesting because what's the way that you most commonly get rid of brambles? Exactly. You burn them. That's how you do it. So they're a source of fire, all right, but they're very destructive. Because if you got a lot of them and you set them on fire, you got to run away. And that's what happens with them. Now, right, Norm said, like, like in California, in the desert areas. Now, so they take this worthless moron, quote unquote, it's in essence what I think Jonathan is saying. You, make, you take this worthless moron, make him your king, and what he's really saying is eventually he will destroy you. That's really the implication here, and we'll, we'll go on about that. You know, there's parallels between the government and California and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. There's yeah. parallels all through this. That's what I'm trying to show you. Yeah, it's sure. amazingly prophetic of human nature and how it's applied to systems, political systems, governments, etc. It's remarkable. So, uh, basically... Uh, uh, he's saying, I really think you people deserve the king that you've got. Okay? Abimelech. I want to quote an interesting quote here. It's an observation. And it's an observation that was taken of Adolf Hitler. And it's by a man who was living in Germany in 1934. His name was William L. Shire. And he was... Uh, he was uh, uh, at the Nazi Party celebration in Nuremberg in September of 1934. He's watching Hitler talk, and here's his observation. The words he uttered, the thoughts he expressed, often seemed to me ridiculous. But that week in Nuremberg, I began to comprehend that it did not matter so much what he said, but how he said it. Hitler's communication with his audiences was uncanny. He established a rapport almost immediately and deepened and intensified it as he went on speaking, holding them completely in his spell. In such a state, it seemed to me they easily believed anything he said, even the most foolish nonsense that came out of his mouth. Now, do you know any movement in this country that's producing foolish nonsense that's coming out of the mouth? But notice in that movement, those people hear that nonsense, and they believe it. When those people came to, to Westerville, Ohio, and had a debate quote in Westerville the other week, do you know how they all introduced themselves? They introduced themselves by picking one of the non-sex-oriented pronouns, and that's how they introduced who they were. In other words, the LGBT, LMQRSZT movement, okay? That, they pick that because they're real picky about, you know, what you're calling yourself. You don't dare call yourself he or she. So each one picked one of those alternate gender ideas, and they introduced themselves that way. Nonsense? Can you imagine 25 years ago, Democratic Party introducing themselves that way? Everyone would have laughed at them. I can't remember the. Okay. I mean, they got like 80 of them. Wow. Oh yeah, it's just ridiculous, you know. And now in California, they're proposing laws, literally, that if you don't respond to someone in their gender intended thing, then that's a civil offense against you, and you can be punished with a fine. Can you imagine that? You're gonna memorize someone's one of their gender JD gender specific concepts of themselves, and you're supposed to always refer to them, and if you don't, you're going to get penalized. And it might not say the same thing. Oh, no, it can be fluid. <laughs> you know, you can be a this one day and a that the next day. That's the, that's the insanity of this, okay? And this is, this is exactly what he's saying about Hitler, okay? There was a spell he produced, and I believe that spell was absolutely demonic because Hitler... And his youth, also at age 21, 22, became a member of the fool movement. 
the fool society was an occult society. Absolutely, they studied the occult. So that's part of his background also. And I think that he became demonized in a major way. And that's why he could have the influence that he had. Do you remember, as our discussions, when he was 12 years old, what was he doing? Do you recall? I talked to you about the possibility about a Catholic priest. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I'd say, you know, I'm going to talk about Hitler and his youth here in a, just in a second. But, I wanted to comment about Yes. That. Since they figured out Al, uh, Albert Speer, or I'll throw another one out, Mussolini and Hitler both held the same job at one point in time before they came to power. And that's a very important part of what Tim was just stipulating because it gave him the ability to communicate. And he could, if you, and I've listened to a lot of the speeches by Hitler, for the Jewish people, he was the devil or the demon. He, he, he couldn't have anything worse yeah. in life. But for the people who wanted to take control, as you're talking about here, he was the demonic entity, period. Yep. He was the bramble bush on his worst. He was the bramble bush, absolutely. We're going to talk about Stalin now. He was the bramble bush, too, in a minute. Honestly? Okay. Um, now, let's read verses 16 through 21, and we'll stop at 21 tonight. Now, therefore, if you have dealt in truth and integrity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbabel in his house, and if you've dealt with him as he deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian. But you have given, uh, you have risen against my father's house today and have killed his sons, <clears throat> 70 men on a stone, on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he's your relative." If then you have dealt in truth and integrity with, with Jerobabal and his house this day, rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech. He's referring to the bramble here, okay? Let fire come out from Abimelech and consume the men of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. That is... They're going to get what they deserve with him. Mutual devastation, mutual destruction. Then Jotham escaped and fled and went to Beer and remained there because of Abimelech, his brother. That doesn't mean he went to a bar. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? So, I'm certain. Jotham ends or reminds them of three things. Number one, Gideon risked his life for their freedom. Two, they attacked the house of Gideon by killing his 69, 69 probably sons. And three, their motivation was, quote, because he's one of you. Okay? He reminds them of those things. Think about, and I, I think about this often, I think about the writings of our founding fathers. I think about the intellectual superiority and, and the... Um, the background of these people, their knowledge, they were very skilled, knowledgeable people. Think about Thomas Jefferson, all his inventions. Think about the way in which he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Think about John Jay. Think about Adams. Think about all these people. Ben, if you, Franklin. ben Franklin, if you read their works, they're brilliant, educated, intelligent people. Okay? Because of that, they set up a republic in this country. Think of what, of the animosity that now people have against those people. They now hate the very constitution 
that these brilliant men set up for this country. They want to tear it down in every way they can, right? It's exactly what they, like they did with Gideon. He gave them freedom, okay? Yeah, he gave them freedom, and what did they do? They used it in the most horrible ways. That's what they did, and then disavowed any loyalty to Gideon and killed all the rest of his sons except Jotham, and of course Abimelech, the other son. What was the nationality of Abimelech? It's hard to say. He was partly Jewish, obviously, but I'm certain his his concubine was not a Jew. Probably Canaanite. Probably Canaanite, you know. The most likely thing from that area in Shechem. Now, Jotham ends up, of course, with great sarcasm here. He says, you've acted so honorably toward Gideon's family and his sons. I'm sure this will turn out well for you. <laughs> that's, a, that's really what he's saying there. All right. He says, their betrayal will become a fire to them, like the thorn bush. It will consume them. And we're going to see fairly soon as we go through the rest of the chapter, it will consume them in civil war and discord and end up in their own demise. That's what they're creating. That's what they're going to end up with. There was a quote here, but I think it's very interesting. The quote says, it's amazing how many bad men eventually get undone by even worse men. (laughs) Isn't that true? And in a movement like this, that's exactly what happens, you know? So, after issuing this prophetic parable, Jotham goes into hiding and to quote beer. The word beer in the Hebrew means a well. Okay? So, we're not exactly clear where he went entirely, but he obviously sought asylum in some place where he could be covered, like in a well. Okay? Now, I want to summarize for a moment here the things that Abimelech did. Let's recount them. First, uh, uh, in his effort to create this coup, first, he is, of course, the forgotten son. He is the disfranchised person who apparently feels left out. Now, I think it's it's fair that he that because he lived in Shechem and not in Ophrah with his father that he probably had relatively little contact with his father and his brother. I think this bred probably anger and resentment towards the father and the brothers, uh, and he lacked a father obviously to grow up under. Clearly, two, he had a lust for power and control. Obviously, at a relatively young age. Three, he makes an alliance with individuals who identify with him, and they resent Gideon and his sons and any viewpoint of Gideon and his sons and anything that they did or stood for, and saw these sons as a threat to his own aspirations. Four, through lies and propaganda, he stirs, up, he stirs up an attitude towards Gideon's sons. He whips up a support from a group, the men of Shechem, that, of course, resent Gideon because Gideon tore down the altar to Baal and Ophrah. They, they, of course, as I stated in Shechem, want to worship Baal. They want to live the lifestyle of moral decadence and sexual promiscuity that was in Baal worship. And they see Gideon's sons as a threat to their moral and religious desires. Five, he seeks a funding source that will, that will fund his program and contracts with agents who will nullify and kill the 70 sons or 69 or 70 sons of Gideon. Okay? I want you to think about what's going on in our country now and the movements going on in our country and think about the parallels here. That's part of what I'm trying to get at. Sixth, the people he hires are, quote, worthless, losers, liars, okay, non-thinkers, non-critical. They'll do whatever is told them to do because of their hatred for Gideon and his, and his sons, okay? So they're unsuccessful. 
they're foolish, they're losers, and if you give them some money, they'll do anything that you want them to do as soon as you whip them into the movement. They end up creating, of course, a public spectacle. Think about this. They create a public spectacle, and they take prominent individuals and assassinate them in public in that spectacle. Does that seem familiar at all to you about anything that's going on? We could call it impeachment. Yeah. Okay? They're creating, trying to create a public spectacle, and they're trying to influence public opinion by that spectacle. They don't care who they pick. They don't care who the witnesses are. They don't care if they contradict each other. They don't care if their background is the worst imaginable. It doesn't matter to them. Their purpose is they're going to find a way to indict the president by whatever means necessary. But there's no validity. It doesn't matter. But it, the, the, the truth of the matter is that the press is bought and paid for yes. by Soros. Exactly. As lo, and you said it. As long as they're in control of what is being produced in the media, no matter what it is, just like Bezos bought the Washington Post, Yes. You're going to get his opinion, which is... That's why the public spectacle. It becomes a forum for their views. It becomes a forum for how they want people to think about the president. Absolutely. That's the whole purpose of it. You can't beat him at the ballot box, so we'll beat him at the... Absolutely. Okay? We'll beat him in the court of public opinion. Now, last, eight, they then, through their efforts, make an effort to install their guy, Abimelech who, of course, will not oppose their desire to live and spread the message of Baal. That, of course, is a, is a short summary of what the agenda of Abimelech was. Now, I want to read two things to, to stop here tonight. Norman kind of cited part of it, which was good, and it's about... I mean, I did some good. You did. You did. It's about Hitler's youth. And I want to write... I want to read you a few things about Hitler's youth because I want... You see the parallels between all these people. They have great parallels between them. So, uh, Adolf Hitler was born on April 20th, 1989. 1889. He was born in, interesting enough, not Germany, but Austria-Hungary. Hitler's parents, uh, Alois Hitler, Alois Hitler, and Clara Polzi, uh, that's his father, they had six children, though only Hitler and his single sister would survive to become adults. The other four died. Hitler's early childhood was very difficult because his father was abusive to the entire family. He had an elbow with him. Mm-hmm. Looking back, it's possible to credit Hitler's earliest childhood with many of his character flaws. It is well known today that abusive parents tend to breed children who are also cruel and abusive. That's absolutely true. It's interesting to note that Hitler was ashamed enough of his childhood to attempt to lie about it, because in his book, Mein Kampf, he paints his upbringing as being idyllic, which was absolutely a lie. Describing his mother as a doting mother and his father as a very responsible man. With all evidence pointing to the contrary, it seems that this was the most likely Hitler's way of painting the appropriate picture for his audience. And that's what he was concerned about. After Hitler's father died in 1903, which would have made Hitler, Adolf Hitler, 14 years old, so at 14 he has no father now, okay, through his teen years, Adolf dropped out of school and moved to Vienna to become a painter. He worked there as a menial laborer also to support his art. He applied to the Academy of Fine Arts two times and was rejected both times. He applied there with aspirations to become a famous painter of watercolors. Both times he was rejected. Okay? In 1908, Hitler's mother died of breast cancer. He spent the next four years selling watercolor postcards on the street of Vienna and living in a homeless shelter. In 1913, 
at the death of his father, Hitler took possession of his father's inheritance and moved to Munich. Now, that's only a few things about the early childhood of Hitler, but think about the, the person who felt disenfranchised, who felt uh, unimportant, who felt that he could never win in the system, that had an abusive father, that, I mean, he was the, the poster child of someone that could become a tyrant. So let's talk about Joseph Stalin. The man who turned the Soviet Union from a backyard country into a world superpower at unimaginable human cost. Stalin was born in a dysfunctional family in a poor village in Georgia, the country of Georgia, not Atlanta, Georgia, okay? Permanently scarred by a childhood bout with smallpox and having, he, he was mildly, dis, he also had a mildly disformed arm. Stalin always felt unfairly treated by life. He romanticized a desire for greatness and respect and combined with a shrewd streak of calculating cold-heartedness towards those who also had maligned him. In other words, he always wanted to punish those who believed that maligned him. He was going to get even with anyone that he felt mistreated him in any way or didn't respect him. He always felt a sense of inferiority before educated individuals and particularly distrusted them. Sent by his mother to the seminary, in, uh, in the capital of Georgia to study to become a priest, interestingly enough, the young Stalin never completed his education and was instead soon completely drawn into the city's active revolutionary circles. Lenin, Lenin, who, of course, was ahead of him in this movement, and his bookish friends lived safely abroad and wrote clever articles about the plight of the Russian working class. Stalin had a different approach. In 1922, Stalin was appointed to another post as the General Secretary of the Communist Party Central Committee. Stalin understood, and this is what Norman pointed out, is good insight. Stalin understood the cadres are everything. If you control the personnel, you control the organization. He shrewdly used his new position to consolidate power in exactly this way, by controlling all appointments of positions, setting agendas, moving around party staff in such a way that eventually everyone who counted for anything owed their position to him. By the time the party's intellectual core realized what had happened, it was too late. Stalin had, had and his, quote, Mostly mediocre, mo, mo, mostly mediocre, mo, mediocre staff of people were all in place. After Lenin's death in 1924, Stalin methodically went about destroying all the old leaders of the party, taking advantage of their weaknesses for standing on arcane intellectual principle to simply divide and conquer them. At first, these were removed from their post and exiled to other countries. Later, when he realized that their sharp tongues and pens were still capable of working against him, even that far away, Stalin switched tactics, culminating in the vast reign of terror and spectacular show trials in the 1930s, which were, were, done, which were uh, uh, during which were the founding fathers of the Soviet Union were the ones who were, quote, unmasked as, quote, enemies of the people, who had supposedly been employed by the capitalist intelligence services and therefore shot to death. Okay? This turned to further repressions, as they are known in Russia, and it, which extended far beyond the party elite, reaching down to every local party cell and nearly all the intellectual professions. Since anyone with a higher education was suspected of being a potential counter-revolutionary, the, the, deplete, the, the depletion of the, of, of the Soviet Union of its brain power resulted, and it left Stalin in the sole intellectual, as the sole intellectual force of the country, an expert on, quote, every human endeavor. That's the way in which he came from his background and manipulated the country and enslaved the people for 70 years. And amazingly, in this country, 
especially in the millennial generation, people in their 40s, they like communism. They've never read about communism. They've never seriously studied communism. They don't even understand what socialism really means. And yet they love it. And now they're turning against the capitalist system, who they see as being against the environment, polluting, misusing funds and resources, okay, destroying in their capitalist ways the environment. Capitalism is being put on trial at this time in our country. Yeah, and unfair to the rest of the world. Right. So, look at what's happening. Millennials to read judges. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good yes, that would be, that would be interesting. So, at any rate, that's the first 21 verses of the ninth chapter. Now you're going to get into even more horrid re intrigue and death as we go into the rest of the ninth chapter. I warned you, in the beginning of Judges, this is an, at least an R-rated session. It deals with a lot of ugly things of human nature in it. So, okay? All of which are going on. All of which are going on. Absolutely. Generation after generation, movement after movement. And would you close us in a word of prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, that you quiet our hearts as we contemplate all the things we've heard tonight. We thank you for your word, how it paints pictures for us to see mm -hmm. what's taking place among human nature. Lord, we thank you that you are the wise one. You are the one that we need to look to, not government, mm -hmm. not movement or anything else. It's you that we need to rely on. And we thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and for your word and what you've given us so we could know. Lord, thank you for Tim's teaching. Thank you for weaving it into um, yesteryear and today. Lord, thank you for each person that's here. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, that um, we can hear and we can learn. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us to use this information to lo grow closer to you day by day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.